And we're back for chapter 11 from The Midwife's Apprentice by Karen Cushman. Chapter 11 is titled, The Leaving. Alice was sitting by the fire one cool November morning, tying up birch twigs for a broom when a pounding came at the door. Jane opened the door to Matthew Blunt, whose mother was about to have another baby and wanted Alice to come and help. Ooh. By the bones of St. Polycarp, who is Alice? bellowed the midwife. This woman refuses to remember this poor girl's name. My goodness. The boy jerked his head toward Alice. Her? Your apprentice? My mom said Alice helped her sister Joan, the bailiff's wife, when no one else could, and so she will have no one but Alice. Her, the dung beetle? The midwife quivered in disbelief. You are asking for her who knows nothing and fears to try and does only what little I bid her and that none too well? She cracked Alice on the cheek. Ooh, so she slapped her. My mom will have no other, repeated the boy. The midwife looked a bit like a mad dog as she spat and spluttered and tried to get words out past all the anger in her mouth. Go then, Alice. Such treachery, such thievery, eating my bread and stealing my mother's go. When she began to throw cooking pots their way, Alice and the boy lit out and ran all the way to Adam Blunt's cottage. Alice stood outside for a minute, surprised by at having been asked for not and knowing whether, oh goodness, <laughs> Alice stood outside for a minute, surprised at having been asked for and not knowing whether to be pleased until the boy nudged and pushed her to the door. She wiped her hair from her eyes, licked her lips, and went in. The cottage was warm and Emma Blunt even warmer, what with her efforts to have this baby and be done with it. Alice rubbed and crooned and fussed as she had with the bailiff's wife, she fed Emma on raspberry leaf tea and comfrey wine. She built up the fire, closed all the windows, and three times called the baby forth. Then she sent Matthew to search for birthwort root, put out the fire, and open all the windows. But the baby would not come, as if he were holding tight to his mother, reluctant to separate and alone. And Alice, although able to ease a willing baby into the world, had no idea how to encourage a reluctant one. So as the day passed from morning to midday and Emma tossed on her tumbled linen and still there was no sign of a baby, Alice, doubtful and uncertain, without the midwife, or at least Will Russet to tell her what to do and unwilling to get herself or Emma into trouble, stood back from the bed and said, I cannot do it. She washed Emma's face, smoothed her wet hair, took a deep breath, and sent Matthew back to the cottage for the midwife. Emma and the unborn baby rested from the morning struggle, so all was quiet until the midwife roared in like wind before rain. What a good simile. Blasting everyone out of her way as she set about attending to mother and babe. She insulted and encouraged, pushed, poked, brewed and stewed and remedied. Anointing her hands with cornmeal and oil, she rubbed and kneaded, pulled and tugged, and turned that baby from both the inside and the outside until finally he was in a position to come out. Then she slapped Emma's great bulge of a belly, lifted her from behind by her shoulders, and gave her a good shake. All was chaos, noise, and heat, and blood, until finally, over the tumult, Alice could hear the cries of a baby, the moans of a tired mother, and the laughter of the triumphant midwife. Alice backed out of the cottage, then turned and ran up the path to the road. She didn't know why or where. Behind her in that cottage was disappointment and failure. The midwife had used no magic. She delivered that baby with work and skill, not magic spells. And Alice should have been able to do it, but could not. She'd failed. Strange sensations tickled her throat, but she did not cry, for she did not know how. And a heavy weight sat in her chest, and she did not moan or wail, for she had never learned to give voice to what was inside her. She knew only to run away. So, in other words, because you guys are probably wondering, what do you mean she doesn't know how to cry? Everyone knows how to cry. She's kind of lived a life where she experienced so much, she probably just turned that part of her brain off and didn't really let herself feel those types of emotions that everyone has to feel once in a while. It's okay for anybody to cry, right? This reminds me of Bud Caldwell from Bud Not Buddy. Remember how throughout the book, he talked about how like there was a tap like a, a faucet that was turned off. So that's why he couldn't cry. It was like the tear faucet was permanently turned off. And that was also because he had been through so much in his life where it's almost like that part of his brain 
that could just tap into his emotions if he was feeling really sad. It was like it was turned off. And remember for Bud, the time he was actually finally able to cry again, like many, many, many years, was with Miss Thomas in that restaurant, right? And he was just feeling overwhelmed with such emotions. So Alice and Bud kind of relate that way. They both went through so much at such a fairly young age. And so Alice, it's probably a little bit like a survival mechanism. She just, there's something in her. It's like she doesn't cry, right? So here we go. So it was that on that crisp, sunny Martin Mass afternoon, while the villagers slaughtered their cattle and pigs for winter meat, while Maggie Miller stirred a sheep's blood pudding for supper, while Will Russet and Dick gathered beech and oak and ash and chestnut for winter fires, while Alnuth the Saxon cleaned the manor privies and cursed God for making him a peasant and not a lord, while the boy Edward ate a bowl of herring soup and thought of the warm corner of the manor kitchen that was to be his. Remember, Edward is a little boy that she met and helped clean up and find him a place to stay stay and eat and work. That's Edward. While Emma, the bailiff's wife's sister, kissed her new son on his tiny red nose and fell asleep with him at her breast. While the life of the village went on, Alice turned her back on all she knew and that had come to be dear to her and headed up the road from the village to she knew not where and the cat went with her. So she's feeling like she's a failure for not being able to deliver this baby. Do you think that makes her a failure? I just think that makes her someone who's younger and not as experienced as the midwife. Sure, she might be a lot kinder to the patients than the midwife is. And sure, she was able to help deliver that other baby. But it sounds like she's just going extra, extra hard on herself for not being able to do it with this one. And so she's just kind of wanting to leave, leave the town and run away. So that was chapter 11, my friends. Keep your eye out for all the rest.